Good evening, Perry. I own a motel. That's your part of you. And you'd be welcome to spend the night in one of the empty rooms if you'd like. Oh, it burns! Oh, it burns! And I'm the devil! <laughs> Hello and welcome to another episode of the Necronomicast. This is Wayne. This is Zip. This is Brian. Hi, it's Doug. What is that? What is that? <laughs> All right, we got a really uh, <laughs> awesome tribute to Friday the 13th because guess what? It is Friday, Friday the, the 13th. 13th this month. Wow. Yeah. That's right. So, uh, and, and this one was uh, actually, uh, Brian, you set this all up. Yeah, we got in right, touch of good old Tom McLaughlin. Yeah, you're, you're kind of a fan you of the movies. You got your shirt all on there. You've seen one or two of the movies, I think. Yeah, I've seen a couple of them, <laughs> couple maybe. Of them. He's <laughs> wearing a, a shirt that's got the Jason mask on it, uh, depicted with Every a bunch of different um, tools. Those and are all the weapons. Those are all tools the weapons. Tools of the trade, available all... from tfury.com. Yeah. Yeah. Not a sponsor, but they should be. One they is a sleeping be. bag, which actually is a weapon. That's right. We talked about in the reboot. In the reboot, it was used. used a flying V at one so point, apparently. Yeah, I guess so. At point A. Yeah. That was that part eight. <laughs> oh, is that Manhattan? It is. I remember yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> On the boat, give you a dollar if you name the name of the boat. The Orca. The Lazarus. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Almost had that. was like ah, second guess. All right. So, yes, uh, we've got an interview with... Uh, well, Brian, go ahead and set this up. We've, we've got a great interview for you today. Um, tell us who this person is and why you got him. Sure. I got Tom McLaughlin through uh, a contact through Facebook. Just kind of reached out to him. Told him I was a big fan of his movie in particular. And, in, and as a Friday fan, his movie, Entry Number 6, Jason Lives was my favorite when I was a kid, as a teenager, growing up, and it still is. I, I just think it's the pinnacle, the best Friday the 13th movie, in my opinion. I know everybody mm. else might have a disagreement on that, and that's fine. We live in America. Yeah. So we got in touch with Tom, and he said, yeah, man, I'll talk to you guys. And we're like, yeah, man, 15, 20 minutes, and then it turned into this huge opus when we talk about life and you know Hollywood in the 60s, 70s, 80s, the music scene. It's a really, it's a really full interview, uh, yeah, yeah. not just about Friday, but boy, do we talk about it! So yeah, it's a, it's a good hour. This is a longer show than normal, mm -hmm. so we're going to go ahead and, and and put up most of the audio up there uh, for everybody to hear it. And uh, yeah, so we're going to get to that uh, first. We were going to kind of also celebrate mm -hmm. Friday the Thirteenth by sharing our favorite Friday the Thirteenth movies and why, real quick. Mm -hmm. So we know what Brian's is. <laughs> right. yeah. Brian's is part six. Yeah, we established that. Yeah, <laughs> no, we did, and and we'll be establishing it further in the interview. As you, my God, as you I talk here. a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, folks. <Yeah. laughs> it's it's cute though. It's great. It is. It's, you you know. did good. Yeah. Uh, I didn't have to talk. Doug, what what was your favorite? Uh, my favorite is number two, and I just rewatched it today after work actually, oh, and I got some notes here so I can tell you just why number two is so awesome. Tell us. Well, first of all. The whole beginning of part two is the end of part one, so you got to watch the best part of part one. Yeah, <laughs> you know when you start this thing. Uh, gosh, let's see. Um, 
I this is before the hockey. This is the well. The first one had really Jason in as a killer, and it's before the hockey mask, and it's where he's got that the elephant man type of bag on his head, which I always thought was really really creepy. And he and he usually has like a pitchfork too, which is pretty awesome. I think. Um, Let me see here. What what do what do I like so much about this? As I was telling you guys earlier, um, this one he gets pretty clever. And Jason is pretty clever in this one. A little bit more than in later movies. He's kind of more uh, just just pure power. And just, I'm just going to go and, 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 and I'm not going to mess around. I think, you know, they're cl- he's more clever in this because they were trying to be clever to scare you. You know, right. obviously. But there's two scenes in particular. There's one, when, when you really first see him, this girl is coming into a room where she's trying to find her friend. And there's obviously a body uh, covered in, with a sheet in a bed. And she's like slowly going towards the bed and she's calling the girl's name that she's looking for. And she reaches out. She's like, you know, Claire, Claire, whatever her name is. And uh, pulls the sheet off. And Jason has actually put himself in the bed and is waiting for her to do yeah. that. And then he just pops right up. And, it, and there's a lot of this in the movie. Right into the Jones. camera. Yeah. Right, right into the camera. And so, I mean, he didn't do any of that later, you know, necessarily, you know. He'd just be waiting, maybe wait in the closet. But, he, yeah. he well, it's clever because you think that's a victim. You think she's gonna, you're going to see something gory, some, something like that. But then you actually see the killer. And then later on at the end, she's uh, the girl is hiding under a bed. And... And you can see her point of view as she's looking all around in the room. And she eventually she doesn't see his feet anymore because he's kind of stalking all around. And so she starts to get out from underneath the bed and looks up. And he's actually, at some point, she obviously missed this, I guess. Yeah. But, but anyway, you know, <laughs> he has stepped up onto a chair so that she can't see him walk around anymore. And then, of course, the chair breaks and he comes falling down and stuff. But... I thought those were two moments where, you know, you have a different kind of Jason right there. You know, a more totally. clever uh, Jason than, than you get in other ones. Well, he does get kind of messed up there as the series progresses. Yes. I mean, killed a few times, you know, yeah, chopped yeah. in the head. He gets he gets hacked in the shoulder really bad yeah. with a machete. Um, you have the shack in the woods in this one, I think, is really Isn't that cool. Creepy His house. Hell? Yeah. And even in the in the first time they go there, it's in the pure it's in daylight. And it's it's very creepy, you know. Like the sheriff's driving along, and all of a sudden Jason just darts across that the road. Is, for me, one of the creepiest yeah. parts of the whole movie when he's just driving the sheriff down the country road. You think yeah. like Andy Griffith and Mayberry, and all of a sudden, boom! And they do the violent stab, and mm-hmm. he he jogs across the road. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And he finds this creepy ass, you know, yeah. you know, shed or not shed, was shack, you know. Um, so that's really cool. And of course, then later when you when when the girl gets there. You know, you see the altar with the head, with his mom's head on it and stuff like that. I mean, <laughs> yeah. that's, you know, and the whole scene where she actually, you know, st- kind of stops him by putting on that sweater. She put she puts on, because mom's sweater is there with the altar. Right, she actually right. puts that on. You can watch her just kind of wiggle, you know, putting that on and then pulling her hair back. And then she starts talking to him like, you know, mommy is happy. You know, mommy's pleased. <laughs> yeah. That good. movie really yeah, established really. the mythology. I think uh-huh. of yeah. Friday the Thirteenth really well. Yeah, it's really creepy. Yeah. So that that's that's my favorite one, definitely. Hot um, chicks too. Hot good chicks. God. The chick with the mini Mouse yeah. shirt and and the nipples and, yeah. the, and the butt the butt cheeks. When she gets hit with the yeah. The skin, she skinny dips too. So there's a skinny dip scene. Yeah. And that's that's awesome. Totally. Kristen um, Baker is the actress's name. Then, Can't remember her yeah. uh, character name. And, oh, she has a little dog, Muffin. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's uh, another thing I put down here. Like, I had to go back. But I'm like, Jason actually kills a dog in this. Yeah. Uh, and, but, like, eats him. Yeah, no. Yeah. Well, and, and, and he didn't just uh, strangle him. or, yeah. or he, like, like It's he's, all Megal. Well, and, and, there's, and there's clever editing, too, in this in two different places. And one of them is that when you see that, you, you see that the dog is dead, they cut to hot dogs on the grill. Right. right yeah. The guy's cooking hot dogs. You know? Yeah. And that that's really clever, you know? Um I'm not sure. Oh, and then there's Granny Pants. That girl is cute. But then I found out that she was 17, and she's still cute. Yeah, yeah. still cute. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She got older. It's funny, you know. She, she when she changes for the guy in the wheelchair, you know, she, she goes upstairs right. to freshen up, whatever. She takes off a pair of like black panties and puts on these kind of ugly brownish. Purple ones, <laughs> whatever was on sale at JC Penney's yeah. that week. Back she she in holds them up. She's yeah. really proud of them, right? Um, right. But 
I mean, I'm sure the cut was the same on both of them, but the black probably would have been sexier. Oh. <laughs> I always felt bad for the guy, for the guy in the wheelchair, in the wheelchair, because like he's like he's gonna get lit, you know, he's in the uh-huh. wheelchair and he's still training, thinks he's gonna walk in, he's he's all Mr. Positive, uh-huh. and then he's gonna get laid, and then he gets the corn knife right in the head, uh-huh. rolls down the, st- you know, great. and that kill is awesome. It's a great kill. That kill, and then the one that comes after that, I I have named it the kebab kill. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's when the two people are screwing on the bed, and the, and Jason comes behind with this and with a spear and just puts it right through both of them. Bravo! Yeah, the kebab kill. The kebab. Yeah. Doug. Ah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Good one, man. Yeah. So that, there's some you know great kills like that in it. Uh, gosh, let me see. Is there anything else? Oh, we're talking about no. yeah, ass cheeks. I mentioned that. Oh, the impossible tree kill. Oh, right, I was telling yeah. you earlier. One, one last thing. There's a kill in it where <laughs> where all crazy Ralph gets it right. You know about this? Oh yeah, yeah. That, that sucks. Yeah, but it's funny. Like it anyone funny. who hasn't know about this, when you if you will watch it, you know, he's a uh, the crazy Ralph guy, the guy that's like you're doomed. He's he's uh, by a tree, and he look and he hears like a branch snap, and he looks, and then all of a sudden two arms come down. From someone standing, by, Jason's behind the tree with barbed wire and go right around his neck, right like this, and pull him up there. But um, they actually, I mean, there's an entire tree out of the shot. That's one the would snap think. you hear is he yeah. snaps through the entire tree <laughs> to get that barbed wire. That's it, man. Because yes. he comes over the whole tree and gets him like that. You know, they, it's not like he swings it around and then catches it. I mean, you can clearly see it just yeah. goes. Boop, over the prop, you know. Right, right, right. <laughs> but totally. it's a, this is that's a, that's why we like the genre. Yeah, yeah of course. So, so. so number two, <laughs> number two is my vote for the best one, at least nice. my favorite. Mm-hmm. I don't have a, as extensive notes as you do. Doug. That's because you're not anal and weird. No, no. Uh, so my first one, and I think I said this before. Uh, my first, my my favorite one is the first one, just because it was uh, when I was a kid, and it, I was very terrified to watch it. Um, my mom had gone and seen it and said it was horrific and, and, and terrifying, and she was a big horror fan too. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, when it came out, I just I was just terrified to see it. And I took it, it took me a few years. How old were you when I saw it? Yeah, uh, I was in my I was like what I was a sophomore in high school, so I may have been like a 15, 14, 14, 15. 14 something like that. Yeah. So, and that was back in probably eighty two, eighty three, eighty two. Yeah, I couldn't do it, man. I couldn't do horror at that time. Yeah, it scared the crap out of me. So finally, yeah, it was, and it was, it was great. I like it. I like it because it it, it is kind of a twist. Uh, there is, there was no at that time. There was no Jason uh, mm-hmm. legacy. Uh, or storyline or anything like that. This was just uh, a lot of boobs. There was sex in it. Uh, there was some some Your crazy first R-rated movie. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. So it was my f- first scary R-rated horror movie that I was terrified to see, and it did terrify me. Mm-hmm. You know, Jaws two also terrified me, but that, yeah, <laughs> I saw that in the theater. <laughs> and, but uh, yeah, so that the so number one was my favorite uh, right off the bat. Also because then going back later as an adult and and being able to uh, learn more about how they filmed it, and and I always like those stories about how rough it was and how horrifying it was to actually film that movie and and so yeah so number one's mine and also the killer is a woman which is yeah uh, yeah, which I don't know how many other movies are like that I mean I think one of the screams or scream 2 or something yeah yeah. it was like Jackie from he was but not a very good swimmer <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. She's great. It's almost like Betsy Palmer it reminds me of the Joan Crawford kind of yeah. uh, he pats her on the head, the, the mommy dearest kind of a thing. You know, she's just a crazy mom. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a great. Oh. She's so good in that movie too. What was your yeah. zip? My favorite one was the third one because of the three oh, D. Mm-hmm. Seeing it in three D. Mm-hmm. Now and, you saw uh, it in the theater, right? I saw it in the theater, Shit. and now as now that we're talking about, it, I'm trying to remember if it was Jaws three in three D or oh, I if saw it that. was. That was or awesome. if it was Friday the 13th 3 and 3D that I saw but I'm pretty sure I saw the Friday the 13th and 3D and I don't it's been a while I haven't watched it I don't have extensive notes it's been a while but I just remember seeing it being right one that I saw in the theater it. it's one I saw in the theater and I, and I remember uh, watching it recently with Brian and the the obvious 3D-ness when you're not watching it in 3D it's just kind of funny to see the scenes in 2D, they're supposed to be like popping out at you. And the best scene for me is the passing the joint from the front <laughs> seat to the back. Or is it back to front? But it's like the hand comes at the camera with the joint. Uh-huh. And then it's the opposite perspective of the guy taking the joint back away from back to himself. Yeah, yeah I was like eight when that movie came out. And I wish <laughs> I was like older in the theater because that, I bet everybody in the theater was like, 
do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So my, my liking of it has nothing to do with uh, worm. It's just uh, drugs. Yeah, yeah, that's, <laughs> it. that's it. Uh, yeah, drugs make you like stuff. That's a kick-ass yeah. one, though. Because that's it's the, a good uh, one. Yeah, when the mask the, is we, introduced, it's yeah. when the mask comes yeah. out with Shelley. Oh, Shelley! And uh, Shelley, he's uh, on all these Friday websites that uh, we subscribe to and whatnot. He's been on so, the show. So, oh yeah, yeah, Larry Zerner. Yeah, yeah you yeah. bet. Has he? Oh, yeah. I don't remember that. So either. it's just great. You know, you got the iconic hockey mask. You've got. You know, the 3D effect, you know, they really established the uh, going to, we're going to go get laid and drunk and yeah. stoned, and mm-hmm. this and is die. what happens, and this is what happens, you yeah, know? Yeah. You know, it's like <laughs> the building, really like, we look at it now and laugh, because, you know, they're planning on making the 13th film, but man, this was fresh in yeah. 82, 83, like, let's make a third one, and what are we going to do this time, mm. you know? The so third one in, like, three, three years, too, yeah. Right. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Because and it's cool, and we talked about this, I think, a little bit with Tom, is that you know these were kind of rogue pictures, you know, because Paramount was making them not with union people. They had to go and use assumed name, you know, like different names for the films, and and you know they were not uh, they didn't use union guys and all that kind oh. of stuff. So it was like guerrilla filmmaking. You mean when they were making it, studio. they were they were using a, a, a pseudonym for the production. That yeah, they for were example, making, I don't like, know, do you know what part three was. Yeah, they're all a lot of them were on David Bowie. Um, song titles. I think uh, <laughs> really? part six when we talked to Tom, uh, Aladdin Sane was number six, and weird. Yeah, That's a they called song? number five repetition as a joke. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Oh, I'd also like to say number four is um, my favorite after number six, and it's uh, and, and now I'll get some a little bit of Friday Street cred here just because <laughs> it's the most slasher. Is it? Of yeah. Because it's got Joe Zito who did like the missing in action films and stuff. It's hardcore. Oh, Number yeah. four is hardcore horror film and six is more whimsical. Still scary. Kick-ass movie. But if you want, it's got the Tom Savini effects and you know oh, yeah. all that stuff. So part four is my... That's not the only one he did the effects for, right? He did number one. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's his hands that are doing the... With the hair on him, right? Tasso's hands. Oh, damn it. See, I try to yeah. pull out knowledge and got in front of this guy. And You guys you <laughs> guys have thinking? your expertise. Mine's Friday. You yeah. Know? yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, we, could, right. we could talk about E.T. sometime. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <Can> school ya. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, well, let's get into the yeah, interview. Yeah, these guys want to hear this. the interview. <laughs> All right. So this is our, our interview. Go ahead and, and bring it in, Brian. Bring yeah. it in. Yeah, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, the director and writer... Of Friday the 13th, part six, Jason lives from Glendale, California, Mr. Tom McLaughlin. Interview part one. Part one. Part one. everybody this is brian here with wayne and doug hello and, and we are here with the great tom mclaughlin probably best known to horror fans as the writer and director of friday the 13th part six jason lives although tom you got this new book out that your your buddy put together and you've had an amazing career and it's still going strong in show business so we want to talk about uh your book about you a strange idea of entertainment conversations with tom mclaughlin Edited by Joe Mattery and everything else Hollywood and horror. So, welcome to the Necronomicast. Thank, thank you, thank you, thank you. Glad to be here. So, yeah, I, I was thinking that we could kind of start off a little bit uh, in the beginning. I know that uh, we've got a lot of information in your book for those that are interested in, in in learning more in depth. In fact, expanding on this, but I always like to try and find out because uh, Friday the Thirteenth Part Six was the, the 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 one and only Friday the Thirteenth that you had written and directed. I wanted to find out how you really launched into film and or horror. What really piqued your interest into doing this movie? It came up to be, okay, it's already a franchise, and how are you going to do it differently? And and when they came to you with it, what really kind of piqued your interest to to do it? Well, boys, it's all in the book on Amazon.com. Next question. Oh, man. (laughs) (laughs) 
Well, I no, 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 no. Um, well, maybe I'll say something that isn't in the book, so then you get actually, you know, bonus because uh, yeah. Joe Madre, who wrote that book, um, or did all these interviews, did yeah. I mean months of interviews with me. I said all kinds of shit, and I got you know he had to go through and try to figure out what he wanted to have in and what he didn't. So, you know, I may end up telling you something that that is not in the book. Uh, but basically, um, I kind of grew up in the Hollywood dream. My father was a, uh, well, he's a magician, and he was a fire eater in vaudeville. He came out to California to go to USC film school because he wanted to make movies. Uh, in 1949, uh, they were not hiring guys that came out of film school. It made no sense. So he ended up getting a regular job, meeting my mother, getting pregnant, she getting her pregnant with me buying a house right next to the old MGM studios so that he could be sort of close to it. And then I was kind of raised with his love of movies and the dream of making movies. So about the time I was, um, I guess about seven, actually, I discovered I could get into the back lot of the old studios um, on the weekends. And with my little eight millimeter camera and friends, we would start making movies there and using those sets so i mean our stuff looked pretty incredible compared to <laughs> oh. you know most people's stuff although we didn't really know what we were doing and in those days you know we shot something on eight millimeter it had to be sent off to some remote place in the world and sometimes it came back and sometimes it didn't oh, yeah. uh and that's not a plug for my other movie yet but um <laughs> the uh the movies were always sort of fragmented, so I don't think I ever got one that was all in one one whole vision that got completed. But it did get me very excited about making movies. It, my dad, I basically, I got all of his dreams um, into me and his enthusiasm, which was all wonderful until like 1962 when the Beatles hit. And um, I suddenly went, you know what? I want to be a rock and roller. I want, I want girls yeah. screaming at me. I want that life. So, uh, so much for my relationship with my father. And uh, uh, he couldn't figure out what the hell I was doing <laughs> as I was getting bounced out of one high school after another because I wouldn't cut my hair. And it's like, it, you know, it was the beginning of, you know, the, the rebellion that was obviously part of my the rest of my existence. But it, you know, the music scene was pretty incredible in those days because despite the fact we were only 15, 16, the group was opening for, you know, groups like The Doors and uh, Love and The Animals and... Um, wow. God, um, and did you Iron have Butterfly a... Butterfly and all the, all the Sunset Strip groups that were there. Yeah, um, yeah. Pink Floyd. I mean, it was, it was an amazing time. But during that whole time, too, I had an incredible affection for kind of gothic horror you know i loved frankenstein dracula you know all all those monsters were you know you know our monsters when we were you know in the 50s 60s because we'd see them you know on tv so that you know that fascination with that that you know writing poems in the in the style of edgar Allan poe definitely connected me to the darker part of my psyche and in a strange way and I guess most horror fans can understand this while the rest of humanity can't there's a strange comfort in that world um, and a lot of different reasons sometimes you relate to the monsters uh, sometimes you like the sense that you feel isolated and un, you know uh, not listened to and not understood and a lot of the things that are inherent with um, you know kind of the classic monster you know us fans usually had some some of those same same feelings um jumping ahead here to the monsters of the 80s you know when we were making those movies in the 80s we didn't think they were anywhere as good as you know the, the monsters of the universal days <laughs> the you know and, and yet you know this was you know i'm sure you guys are of the age of, you know these were your monsters you know mm -hmm. yeah. michael myers jason freddie pinhead the stephen king you know creations all of that, you know, yeah. have now become what Frankenstein, Dracula, the Mummy, Wolfman were to to us back then. Absolutely. So it, you know, it, it, it's you know, it's all sort of the same now, and I'm only beginning to now 
truly appreciate that. And that the fact that in my Friday, um, as most people know, I borrowed a lot from those influences, mm-hmm. you know, including when my job was to bring Jason back, you know, I went for the Frankenstein approach. You know, we're going to hit him with a lightning bolt and he's <laughs> yeah, going to yeah. be alive, yeah. alive. <laughs> so, um, you know, and at the same time, I wanted to make sure people knew we were having, you know, I, I was having fun with it because I guess I was responsible being the scriptwriter as well with, you know, calling Carlos, you know, uh, mm-hmm. market and everything. You know, there was all these little subtle uh, in jokes and things that uh, I felt was important by the time you got to the sixth one, to say, look, I want to scare you, but I want to also have fun, you know, right. make this a, a ride. Was that part of the, Was so, there, were you intimidated at all as far as doing the sixth one to, uh, or, or did you say, screw it, I'm just going to do it the way I feel it should be done? Because it seems like we were talking about this earlier, that, it, that it's, it, the tone of the movie was different than the 80s movies that were coming out at the time, the 80s so, horror movies. It's a lot less brutal you know, like you said, you were having. It was, there's more of a flair uh, and an uncommon touch to to your directing style, and uh, and you know we kind of contributed that also to your director photography and and everything else about the movie. And the but synth, and the, like the music, and uh, it's the, aged remarkably yeah. well. And uh, you know, yeah, well that's 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 the trip. I mean, you know, if you ask me what my favorite Friday is, and I'll say Part Four because when I had to sit there and watch them all back to back, and I mean, I was familiar with the first one, and I was a fan of the first one because I thought. You know, again, this was in an age when everybody was doing a slasher movie. And right. it was like the easiest way to get a deal was like, all you need is a knife, some <laughs> something over somebody's head, you know, pits, screaming girls, yes. you know, great kills, you know, the, the, the next up and coming Tom Savini. And you were in, you know, and if you could do it for a million or under, then, you know, you did, it was profit for whoever was involved. Um, my very first horror movie, um, One Dark Night, was the antithesis of that. It was purely a gothic, Edgar Allan Poe kind of approach with claustrophobic things being, you know, crypts opening up, bodies coming out. And I tried to make it, um, you know, very intense and very serious and also very much into something I'm also very fascinated with is the, you know, uh, paranormal sciences. And bringing in this idea of a psychic vampire and so on. So that that movie was sort of a, you know, throwback to the old days. It By, by horror standards, it was not considered, you know, what was the, you know, the slasher, successful slasher movies. It's like trying to release something like that when we were in the middle of the torture porn movies, you know, right. uh, well, that were, were happening. So, yeah, it was... You know, that, that kind of put me in this other category for the longest time. But then Frank Mancuso uh, was disappointed. Um, after, well, he was actually, they were excited because part four did so well. And they wanted, they didn't want it to be the final thing. They wanted one more. And the whole notion of bringing back Jason, nobody quite thought of. So they ended up creating, uh, you know, part five, which wasn't really Jason. Mm-hmm. And... The, uh, Danny Steinman, who did a very good job making a very edgy, uncomfortable, intense horror movie, it somehow turned off a lot of the fans, A, because it wasn't Jason, and second, you know, it was more, you know, over the top in terms of the kills and sex and so on, and wasn't particularly fun. Um, at least that's, you know, what was conveyed to me, and I sort of stopped on part four when I was putting this together and said, okay, I want to just pretend like five didn't happen <laughs> oh, yeah. and still keep the same basic rules that it is Tommy Jarvis, that he did go into an institution, but, you know, all this business about a phony Jason, no, Jason, you know, was killed on part four and buried, and my marching orders uh, were twofold, you know, bring back Jason, figure it out, however you can bring, we want Jason back, and we want it to be whatever you want to do with it. You know, he did. Frank was really okay about what I wanted to do. And I said, well, I'd like to put humor in it. He goes, well, what do you mean by that? And I said, well, I want, I want the characters to be likable. I want it to feel like a real movie and not just, you know, a, a series of kills of people we don't care about. But I want them to have a sense of humor. Um, and I hope the whole movie, you know, kind of can be perceived that we're having fun with this. So getting back to plug the book again... <laughs> 
yeah. um, strange idea of entertainment. <laughs> um, in the back of that book, Joe was cool enough to say, hey, why don't we include for the fans the original treatment that you wrote that basically got me the job oh, of cool. writing and directing uh, Friday the 13th. So I, I'm holding it in my hands right now, Tom. I've got the book on Amazon. And it was uh-huh. delivered this weekend, and I, I read through actually the treatment that you're talking about over breakfast this morning. And uh, so, so you submit this first after you got hired um, by Mancuso. So you got hired, and then he said, write a treatment, and then this is what you submitted, right? Well, it sort of was, look, they saw One Dark Night, and I was up for another movie that ended up falling through. Uh, and I can't remember why, finances or something. So then I was offered this, and I kind of was going, well, you know, my whole background was I, I want to make horror movies, but I really don't want to make, you know, full-on slasher movies. Mm-hmm. I just had a, I just felt it was just too easy, um, and I'm more interested in, you know, getting under people's skin psychologically um, with horror, or, you know, if you're going to do something, do something that's like not imitation, you know, you can't imitate. I mean, it's, so it's not just sticking a knife you know, in in somebody's chest, you know, if you kind of look at the kills in that movie, they're all like super strength. I mean, you you got you know be able to twist the head all the way around and knock <laughs> oh, yeah. it off. The triple you decapitation. Know, yeah. It's not your Ted Bundy, you know. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and uh, you know, it's triple decapitations and all that. Um, it was all about saying, okay, I want to go. You know, the, the as far as I can go with this, knowing I'm sort of justified because. You know, you can't kill Jason. You know, he's now yeah. been brought back this way, and I didn't think of him so much as a zombie. It's just like, you know, uh, you know, an undead Terminator. What's and, great about <laughs> yeah. What's great about the movie to me as a horror fan? You mentioned Part Four as being kind of like your favorite when you're going back and watching them, and, I, and mm-hmm. Part Four is my second favorite. I'm the Friday nerd of, of the group. Yes, yes, Part Four is my <laughs> second favorite. Um, I think Joe Zito did a great job, but that's a straight up slasher film. And yours, uh-huh. and you talked about this earlier, and it's and it's it's in the book, a strange idea of entertainment. We're going to plug it again. Everybody needs to get it. But what's neat about your movie? Uh, it's a not a zombie. It is a monster movie. So there's like a definite rule, kind of like with Dracula. You know, you gotta you gotta get him uh, with the with the garlic or the stake through the heart. You gotta get him with the yeah. sunlight. Like, like Jason had a very specific way that Tommy figured out through those books. Uh, yeah. how, how to dispatch Jason and um, and he was kind of the anti-hero we, we joke that um, <clears throat> if it wasn't for Tommy you know Jason would have been in the ground and you know nothing would have happened until uh, exactly. the guys from Poltergeist came and dug up the cemetery and put, <laughs> put a subdivision over his grave you know I mean, that's, that's where yeah. we thought it would go oh, you know good. but uh, so Tommy digs him up uh, and, and Jason becomes a monster, and it's a it's a it's like a monster movie, and it's beautifully shot. And I love the fact that in the uh, the director's commentary, you mention watching it in black and white. And so yeah. one night, I was like, "What the hell?" So I pop it in black and white, and man, is that effective? You I mean, did that. yeah, it's a great. It's yeah. just it's it, it's and it's a testament to your filmmaking. I don't know if you were trying to do that at the time or if it was a happy accident. But uh, I think oh, that's no, no, one no, of the. No, 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 it was no accident. No, that's very, very intended. Um, nice, because, nice. Again, my understanding with movies is they need to act kind of as a dream. And mm. there's so many times people say, yeah, I don't know if I dream in black and white or color. or You know, you don't really think of it. But somehow when movies first came out and they were black and white, um, they did have kind of a, a, a different special effect because it wasn't life. You know, but it the, the, the contrast and the way it was bigger than life on that screen, and mm. you know how it literally went into kind of a part of mm-hmm. our brains when they work at a particular cycle. It it does have the same effect as as a dream does, and so I wanted to go and say, all right, I'm going to do this. I want it to really feel like a classic horror movie, and then at the same time, I I, I know from having studied comedies that a lot of the silent movies, if you look at them today, they're almost laughable, the serious ones. But the the comedians, you know, the uh, Charlie Chaplin, Buster Keaton, Harold Lloyd, all those, those movies survive because there's something about comedy that if it still works, it's still, you know, relatable and it's still fun and it, you know, continues on. Now, I never thought about that exactly at, at that time, but what I've come to find out now is it has been really well uh, beloved because it, you know, it still sort of stands up. I mean, I, I've got so many people. 
I mean, the fan letters I get every week and uh, Facebook friends and stuff from, you know, a whole new generation every year that discovers it. And it's not like, you know, it's not old. It feels still fresh to them. Yeah. And I think, again, it's because of the sense of humor and sort of approaching it like, you know, we're going to make a fun, hopefully nonstop roller coaster ride through it. And you never know where it's going to go next, from a car chase to underwater fights to, you know, a touch of religion with a little Nancy character praying to, you know, one kill you see and then another kill you just see the massive, you know, aftermath of the, in the, in yeah. the uh, cabin and things. So I really tried to keep breaking it up and coming up with, you know, different surprises and hopefully, you know, different, different twists on yeah. how... Jason would kill somebody with this incredible strength. It's great. But all he wanted was Tommy. You know, that yeah. was the whole yeah. objective. Right. And that, what kind of reminds me, when you're talking about, like, older movies, and it, it has a, a, a real fresh, crisp, fast delivery of really keen dialogue. And what it kind of reminds me of, and I hope nobody laughs out there, but I was watching a Humphrey Bogart marathon not too long ago, and the movie Key Largo came up. And there's such great uh-huh. tension in that movie. When the, the hurricane's passing by, they're all stuck in that hotel, and you've got Bogart, you've got Green Street, and all that bullshit going on. And dialogue is so important to that movie because it's just four adults in a room with a, you know somebody's holding a gun, but there's just such tension that's brought on by the dialogue. And your your movie has such great, crisp, delivered uh, kind of madcap dialogue that it's it's different than part five. It's different than part seven. It, it, it's really well delivered and, and really keen writing, Tom. Well, that again, that comes from a study and a great love of the of the screwball comedies of the thirties and forties that Hollywood made. You know, the the films um, bringing up Baby that Howard Hawks did. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, some of John Ford's movies, uh, Preston Sturgis, yeah. and of course, you know, my mentor, Frank Capra. They, these writers and Billy Wilder, they would create slang. You know, they'd come up with these um, crazy things. You know, uh, I remember one of the examples that, that somebody gave at one point, and it's like, uh, you know, you know, is she sexy? Is she sexy? Every time she looks at me, I break out in monkey bites. <laughs> it's like, what? What? But I mean, you get exactly what we're talking about, but it's some yeah. great, you know. So, you know, starting with um, One Dark Night, you know, we were coming up with, you know, Nerdle, Nerdle Brain and, you know, this little, you know, thingy, and we just say thingy, what do we call it? Um, you know, uh, there was a term that we, you know, you came up with. It. I mean, it's, it's just nonsense. But if the actor understands, you know, what the intention is, and it's a different slang word, it really works. Which is what I loved about Diablo Cody's uh, Juno, because mm. she did the same thing. I mean, out came these great things that you'd know, like. Is that? Is everybody saying that now? And I just missed it. Like, no, no, she created that shit, and <laughs> you just make that it's wonderful. <laughs> So that's really what all that was, was you know, saying, you know, I, I want the stuff to go rapid fast, because what Frank Capra had taught me was, you know, you got to look at everybody smart, and if you talk, intelligent people talk fast, and it makes the audience, and makes the listener yes, we do. listen up. <laughs> and so it's uh, like, if it's rapid well, fire, you're, you're right there with them, you know, and, and you like them because, you know... I wish I could have thought of come, that kind of comeback. I wish I would have done that, you know. Mm-hmm. And Jennifer in that movie, um, mm. Megan, was very much like what a Barbara Stanwyck was back in the day, um, as a you know kind of a smart mouth, you know, sexy blonde that you know could snap them back with the boys, you know. And, and that's again, it was all those influences that I kind of put into the movie so it's you know it's also a tribute to you know to movies as yeah. well as being a Friday the 13th we were, we were just actually we just had a, a, a previous podcast where we talked about our favorite uh, well more of the influential horror movies of the 80s that kind of changed the way we look at horror and what we noticed was that a lot of them had humor in them so like mm-hmm. Return of Living yeah. Dead again you know with this you yeah know, and uh, and uh, Evil Dead t- uh, Two, and there's been there was a lot coming reanimated, a lot coming out at the time that that started to input a little bit more humor into horror. Um, and was that something that uh, when you when you did this was that was that part of your kind of idea? Is that yeah, we want to have fun with it, just like it, it's happening. This is the way it's kind of changing the way. Uh, it's just it's it's a different way to shine a horror movie. Yeah. 
Well, I, re- I really wanted to do comedies. I mean, uh, I have, <laughs> you know, two big passions in, in, well, I guess three, but the, the third one is not as easy to, to do as the other two, which is comedies and horror, and then the other thing is, you know, inc- you know incredibly heartfelt romance. Toughest thing to do because it can be really corny really fast, but the thing about horror and and comedy or horror suspense thrillers you know you know when it's working i mean you sit in the theater and if they're laughing it's a it's a comedy you know Mm -hmm. if they're laughing it's a serious movie you're in big trouble (laughs) you know but in when you do drama and i've done a lot of drama over the years it's like is anybody liking this you know are they squirming no Mm -hmm. are they getting up to go to the bathroom no you know are they sticking to well i guess they like it they're 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 there and it's not till the very end that you go well what do you think you know, and sometimes they can articulate it, and sometimes no, it's good, it's good. But you know, with with horror, if they're jumping, if they're down in their you know screwed down in their seats, afraid to look, you know, past you know through their their hands at what's going on on the screen, you know the ship's working, and mm-hmm. that's really what I wanted to do with um, the genre. And that wasn't anything that was particularly new in in that time period and because the late 70s and 80s the audiences loved to react to the screen i mean it was a very noisy affair in horror movies in particular um and if you saw them you know in in the lower class areas as and that was their key entertainment i mean action movies and all that stuff they would be you know screaming and yelling and i thought you know what why not set up jokes that the audience will give us the payoff, and then they'll get the laugh and they'll get the credit for being so funny. So, you know, I experimented with that a bit with uh, One Dark Night on a couple of things, and then, of course, did it even more with um, the Friday, uh, like when Nancy's killed and the American Express card is is floating, (laughs) you know, from her hand, and there would always be some guy in the back that would go, don't leave home without it, which was... (laughs) You know, which was on you know the big commercial at that time. So, and everybody would laugh, and this yeah. guy would get pats on his back, and he was so <laughs> clever. And I thought, great, that's perfect. There you go. Hey, Tom, you know, let, you know. <clears throat> were you were you married to Nancy at the time when uh, you were writing um, part six? Uh, well, yeah. I mean, we got married in uh, in eighty three. Okay. So, so as a from, yeah. a from a married guy talking to married guy, how do you propose to your wife uh, a scene that you're writing for this big movie? Hey, did you write it for her, or did she just get the part? You know, uh, I just wondered, like, hey, honey, uh, today at work we're going to put you into a muddy puddle, and the monster is going to stab you in the face with a spear. Uh, is that cool? <laughs> yeah. Well, well, guys. I mean, you know, it, it, you know, if you if years ago there was a Jack Lemmon picture called How to Murder Your Wife, yeah. and it was um, oh yeah, right. You know, it, it was a comedy uh, about a guy that, you know, basically had the most beautiful wife in the world, but he was writing this comic strip about, you know, how to do it, and then she disappeared, and then it's like they thought he actually did it. But the funny thing here is that, you know, I said, when I was writing this thing, I said, I'm going to write a, you know, a part in here, and, and you're going to, it's like Janet Lee, you're going to die <laughs> really early. And it's like, what? <laughs> And, you, and I said, I promise you, this thing will be, people will remember this. And it's like, you know, oh, come on. You know, and it's like, you don't want me to be one of the counselors. I said, no, no, that's not it. It's like, I, you know, I, I just feel like the counselors will be great. And yeah, they'll get more days and stuff. But I want to give you something that's more memorable that I know you can do. She's got a hell of a scream. And I knew that that was important, you know, for that sequence that, that Jason silenced that scream with that spear. Right. But... At the same time, what I didn't count on is, you know, when C.J. Graham took over the the part, you know, he's like an ex-Marine, and uh, like yeah. the infamous, and maybe some of you guys already know this story about the, you know, she, he was supposed to take that spear, and we had one windshield, we could only do it once, and, you know, and we <laughs> lined it up with the stunt coordinator, and I said, okay, she's going to be there at the driver's side, just aim right at her, you know, and she's going to move just in time, so that, you know, but... <laughs> being trained, you know, in in the uh, you know the armed forces, and uh, it, she started the move, and his spear just went right with her body. Yeah, yeah. so you when he jammed almost... that thing in there, I mean, he <laughs> just missed 
center by, I mean, we're talking like maybe like a half an inch of that. Yeah, you almost made a snuff film. Whoa. (laughs) Hey, Tom, we were just watching the, uh, before we called you, we uh, popped in the the new deluxe edition of the DVD. Same thing with the Blu-ray. Uh, and uh-huh. it has the special features, and there's the great alternate ending that um, that Bob Larkin narrated with Cash Cunning, uh, Crash Cunningham's drawings with your alternate ending, which is kind of yeah. also in your book, A Strange Idea of Entertainment. Mm-hmm. Um, so with your alternate ending that you kind of had proposed, uh, where do you kind of see, did you see Tommy Jarvis being in part seven, if you were going to do part seven, or you know, what was the story with Jason's dad? That was, you know, what I said earlier, I kept looking for what can I do different with this that hasn't been done. And so, you know, a lot of it we already talked about in terms of the style, the humor, the likability of the guys, but, you know, the references to other horror movies and horror directors and all that. But then I thought, well, by the time you get to the end, you know, it's still the same thing that we got to somehow kill Jason but everybody knows you're never going to really kill Jason, and if you do, they're going to be a little upset if they think that's really the end. So there was, you know, there was a number of different endings that we played around with. Um, but the one that I thought would be the most interesting is that, you know, you, you know, you see Martin and the, and the old caretaker, and suddenly this guy comes in who's almost like almost like a Sengali type, you know, you know, long coat, and there's just something just dark and evil about him. Um, I was, again, I think, going back to my Raymar character, you know, I have a, a huge affinity for those, you know, chiseled face, intense eyes, you know, individuals, and maybe it's because, you know, I, I just love John Barrymore in the movie Sengali. It just stuck in my subconscious ever since I saw it as a kid. Um, and his and his eyes and things and just somebody in that vein, and then you start thinking, oh yeah, okay, you know, say he he did come out and he you know he was deformed and you know maybe mentally challenged or whatever, but there is an evil gene in there, you know, that started with obviously seeing his mother getting killed and that whatever that power was that you know, it, as the myth of the legend goes, brought him up out and you know now he's out. Like father, know, like son. Thinking. Like father, yeah. like son. So then, yeah, so then when dad came, it was a question of, okay, is he, you know, is he going to take over the franchise? No, I never wanted that. I just wanted that to be sort of lurking out there as, you know, <laughs> you know Luke, I'm your father. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's this entity that could do things that, you know, it's not like he's trying to defend Jason or anything else, but he, you know, I, I had a lot of just kind of crazy ideas where that could go. But it got stopped pretty quick by, <laughs> by Mr. Mancuso, who said, look, you know, the fans were so pissed off at the last one where it wasn't Jason. And if we end this and we're, we're hinting at the fact that maybe this guy is going to be taken over the franchise. No, they want Jason. And I go, I hear you. Okay, fair enough. Um, and so that, you know, was the main reason yeah. it was taken out, because they, you know, wanted to say, okay, he's back, the man behind the mask. Yeah. Thank you very much, Alice. And um, that's what it was about. So, you Still know, sounds like was, a cool uh, character to, to yeah. one day have, like, Voorhees, and then <laughs> that would be the start of another complete franchise. Yeah, I game. mean, yeah. If, if you guys remember the tall man, you know, character, oh, sure. and has them, and the, you know, yeah. those kinds of characters, they don't have to do much. But, you know, their presence, you know, is pretty fucking scary. And they don't have to run fast. They don't have to go with weapons. But whatever they're going to do, you know, it's going to be bad. So, um, it you know, it it just was one of those kind of interesting ideas that maybe somebody will do someday. I don't know. Or or they'll never get that. You've been listening to the Necronomicast, a weekly podcast produced by Wayne Brecky, part of the Free Life Media Network. For show notes and other information, go to necronomicast.com.